the work of Eric Erickson has had a profound influence on psychoanalysis as well as the general culture. His books were bestsellers, and his picture appeared on the covers of Newsweek and the New York Times Magazine. Unusual recognition for a personality theorist. And he achieved this high level of prominence without ever earning a university degree in any subject. Trained in the Freudian tradition by Freud's daughter, Anna, Erickson developed an approach to personality that broadened the scope of Freud's work while maintaining its core. Erickson extended Freud's theory in three ways. He elaborated on Freud's stages of development, suggesting that personality continues to develop over the entire lifespan. He placed greater emphasis on the ego than on the id. In Erickson's view, the ego is an independent part of personality. It is not dependent on or subservient to the id, as Freud had said. He recognized the impact on personality of cultural and historical forces. He argued that we are not governed entirely by innate biological factors at work in childhood. Although they are important, they do not provide a complete explanation of personality. Here's a brief outline of the chapter and this lecture. We'll begin with an overview of post-Freudian theory. Then a brief biography of Erickson will be presented. Uh, the ego in post-Freudian theory is described a little differently. Uh, let me explain briefly. Erickson believed that the ego that Freud described was far more than just a mediator between the superego and the id. He saw the ego as a driving force in human development and personality. He believed the ego's main job was to establish and maintain a sense of identity. Those who have weak egos or poorly developed egos get trapped in an identity crisis, which is a time when they lack direction and feel unproductive. Erickson believed we all have an identity crisis from time to time, and these crises are not necessarily negative, but can be forces that drive us toward a positive place or resolution of the crisis. Like uh, Freud and other personality theorists, Erickson said personality develops in a predetermined order. Erickson identified eight stages of psychosocial development, which we will look at. This lecture then discusses Erickson's method of investigation, some related research, uh, a critique of Erickson's theory, and finally a look at Erickson's concept of humanity. One of Freud's major contributions was to stimulate the work of other theorists. Eric Erickson was one of the most talented and imaginative of these theorists. While recognizing Freud's ideas and contributions, Erickson moved away from the negativity of Freud's ideas and theories and challenged the notion that personality is primarily established during the first five or six years of life. He observed that if everything goes back to early childhood, then everything becomes somebody else's fault. And this affects having trust or confidence in your own abilities and what you learned along the way. Erickson concluded that personality continues to develop over the lifespan. His optimistic view emphasizes success, growth, greatness, and the flowering of human potential by working through psychosocial struggles along the way. Erickson also emphasized the social and historical context of life and wove this into Freud's ideas of the internal aspects of the mind, like the ego. Here's a, a brief biography, and it is not surprising that the theorist who gave us the concept of the identity crisis experienced several of the same kind of crises of his own. Erickson was born in Frankfurt, Germany, where his mother had gone to be with friends after the breakup of her first marriage. He was the son of a Jewish mother and unknown father, and as a child, he didn't feel accepted by either the Jewish or Gentile community. Actually, he didn't learn about his parentage until uh, adolescence, that period in his life when he went through an identity crisis, which is a term that he coined as a normal stage of development. He had been led to believe that his stepfather, Dr. Theodore Homburger, was his biological father. His mother had met Dr. Homburger and married him after she took three-year-old Eric to the pediatrician when he was ill. Erickson's birth resulted from an extramarital liaison, 
and Erickson kept his mother's secret until he was 68. Erickson was known as Eric Homburger until he immigrated to the United States in the early 1930s. He left home at 18 to live as an itinerant artist wandering Europe for seven years. Erickson actually dropped out of conventional society and traveled extensively in Europe, reading, recording his thoughts in a notebook, and observing life around him. Erickson studied at two art schools and had his work exhibited in an art gallery in Munich, but each time he left formal training to continue his wandering, his search for an identity. Rather surprisingly, lacking an academic degree, Erickson accepted a research position at Harvard Medical School in 1933. He published his uh, well-known book, Childhood and Society, in 1950. Also taught at Yale, Berkeley, and several other institutions. He was the professor of human development at Harvard in 1960 and died in Cape Cod in 1994, a month short of his 92nd birthday. One of Erickson's chief contributions to personality theory was his emphasis on ego rather than id functions. According to Erickson, the ego is the center of personality and is responsible for a unified sense of self. It consists of three interrelated facets, the body ego, the body ideal, and the ego identity. The ego is a positive force that creates identity. It unifies experiences in an adaptive manner. The ego develops within a social structure. The ego develops within a given society and is influenced by child rearing practices and other cultural customs. All cultures and nations develop a pseudo species or fictional notion that they are superior to other cultures. In the past, this notion helped the tribe or culture to survive. Nowadays, this notion leads to prejudice and conflict in the world. The ego develops according to the epigenetic principle, that is, it grows according to a genetically established rate and in a fixed sequence. Later development depends on how early conflicts were resolved. Erickson was the first to offer a model of de a personality development that extended over the entire lifespan and included social and cultural influences. He called this the psychosocial stages of development as opposed to uh, Freud's psychosexual stages of development. Each stage has a crisis that can either be successfully or unsuccessfully uh, resolved. There are eight stages. Uh, later, with his wife Joan, a ninth stage was added for very old age, late 80s and beyond, which includes facing a new sense of self over failing bodies and recognizing the need for care. The favorable outcome for this ninth stage is achieving a new sense of wisdom and transcendence. I found an old interview with uh, Joan and Eric Erickson, which I included in this module. Right now, here's a brief overview of the stages. Here are some basic points to remember about this particular stage approach. Growth follows an epigenetic principle. Each of the eight stages of development is marked by a conflict between a syntonic element, which is harmonious with the ego, and a dystonic element, which is disruptive to the ego, and this produces a basic strength or ego quality. Conflict uh, produces ego strength. Too little strength at one stage results in core pathology at a later stage, and the stages are also uh, biological in nature. From adolescence on, each stage is characterized by an identity crisis or turning point, which may produce either adaptive or maladaptive adjustment. Erickson's view of infancy, the first year of life, was similar to Freud's concept of the oral stage, except that Erickson expanded the notion of incorporation beyond the mouth to include sense organs such as the eyes and ears. The psychosocial crisis of infancy is basic trust versus basic mistrust. From the crisis between basic trust and basic mistrust emerges hope, the basic strength of infancy. Infants who did not develop hope retreat from the world, and this withdrawal is the core pathology of infancy. Some important things to remember about the trust versus mistrust stage. If this stage is completed successfully, the child will emerge with the virtue of hope.
Even when challenges emerge, a person with this quality will feel that they can turn to loved ones for support and care. Those who fail to uh, gain this virtue will experience fear. When a crisis occurs, they may feel hopeless, anxious, and insecure. The second to third year of life is early childhood, a period that compares to Freud's anal stage, but it also includes mastery of other bodily functions, such as walking, urinating, and holding. The psychosocial crisis of early childhood is autonomy versus shame and doubt. The psychosocial crisis between autonomy on one hand and shame and doubt on the other hand produces will, the basic strength of early childhood. Some important things to remember uh, about this particular stage is that this stage helps to set the course for further development. Children who succeed in this stage will have a greater sense of their own independence. Those who struggle may feel shame related to their efforts and abilities. From about the third to the fifth year, children experience the play age, a period that parallels Freud's phallic phase. Unlike Freud, however, Erickson saw the Oedipus complex as an early model of lifelong playfulness and a drama played out in children's minds as they attempt to understand the basic facts of life. The psychosocial crisis of the play age is initiative versus guilt. The conflict between initiative and guilt helps children to act with purpose and to uh, set goals. But if children have too little purpose, they develop inhibition, the core pathology of the play age. Some important things to remember about the initiative versus guilt stage. Kids who successfully master this stage emerge with a sense of initiative, while those who do not may experience guilt. The virtue at the center of this stage is purpose, or the sense that they have control and power in the world. The period from about 6 to 13 is called the school age, a time of psychosexual latency, but it is also a time of psychosocial growth beyond the family. Because sexual development is latent during the school age, children can use their energies to learn the customs of their culture, including both formal and informal education. The psychosocial crisis of this age is industry versus inferiority. Children need to learn to work hard, but they also must develop some sense of inferiority. It is at this stage that the child's peer group will gain greater significance and will become a major source of the child's self-esteem. The child is coping with new learning and social demands. Children who struggle during this stage have prob problems with self-confidence uh, as they grow older. From the conflict of industry versus inferiority emerges competence, the basic strength of school age. Adolescence begins with puberty and is marked by a person's struggle to find ego identity. It is a time of psychosexual growth, but it is also a period of psychosocial latency. The psychosocial crisis of adolescence is identity versus identity confusion. Psychologically healthy individuals emerge from adolescence with a sense of who they are and what they believe, but some identity confusion is normal. The conflict between identity and identity confusion produces fidelity or faith in some ideological view of the future. Lack of belief in one's own selfhood results in role repudiation or an inability to bring together various self-images. Some important things to remember about this particular stage, those who are allowed to go through this personal exploration and successfully master this stage emerge with a strong sense of independence, personal agency, and sense of self. Those who fail to complete this stage successfully often enter adulthood confused about who they are and what they want out of life. Young adulthood begins with the acquisition of intimacy at about the age of 18 and ends at about age 30. The psychosexual mode of young adulthood is genitality, which is expressed as mutual trust between partners in a stable sexual relationship. Its psychosocial crisis is intimacy versus isolation. Intimacy is the ability to uh, fuse one's identity with that of another person without fear of losing it whereas isolation is the fear of losing one's identity in an intimate relationship. Uh, 
The crisis between intimacy and isolation results in the capacity to love. The core pathology of young adulthood is exclusivity or inability to love. Success during this phase of development leads to strong bonds with others, while failure can result in a sense of isolation and loneliness. Again, the basic virtue that develops at this stage is love. The period from about 31 to 60 years of age is adulthood, a time when people make significant contributions to society. The psychosexual mode of adulthood is procreativity, or the caring for one's children, the children of others, and the material products of one's society. The psychosocial crisis of adulthood is generativity versus stagnation, and the successful resolution of this crisis results in care. Erickson saw care as taking care of the persons or products that one has learned to care for. The core pathology of adulthood is rejectivity or the rejection of certain individuals or groups that one is unwilling to take care of. Those who master this stage of development emerge with a sense that they have made a significant and valuable impact on the world around them and developed the basic strength Erickson referred to as care. The final stage of development is old age, from about uh, 60 until the late 80s. The psychosexual mode of old age is generalized sensuality that is taking pleasure in a variety of sensations and an appreciation of the traditional lifestyle of people of the other gender. The psychosocial crisis of old age is the struggle between integrity, the maintenance of ego identity, and despair, the surrender of hope. The struggle between integrity and despair may produce wisdom, the basic strength of old age, but it may also lead to disdain, a core pathology marked by feelings of being finished or helpless. As Erickson himself aged, he and his wife began to describe a ninth stage, a period of very old age, when physical and mental infirmities rob people of their generative abilities and reduce them to waiting for death. Joan especially was interested in this ninth stage as she watched her husband's health uh, decline rapidly, uh, and especially during the, the last few years uh, of his life. People who master the final stage of life emerge with a sense of wisdom and uh, feel that they have lived a worthwhile and meaningful life, even though they face the grim specter of death. Let's move on now to uh, look at Erickson's methods of investigation. Erickson relied mostly on anthropology and psychohistory to explain and describe human personality. Erickson's two most important anthropological studies were of the Sioux of South Dakota and the York tribe of Northern California. Both studies demonstrated his notion that culture and history help shape personality. For the Sioux, he found children who were taught apathy as a result of dependence on the government programs, integrated it into their adult personalities. For the Yurik, he found cultural values were consistent with childhood training. Erickson combined the methods of psychoanalysis and historical research to study several personalities in what he called a psychohistory. The most notable personality was Gandhi, uh, and he also studied Martin Luther. In both cases, the central figure experienced an identity crisis that produced a basic strength rather than a core pathology. His psychobiography of Gandhi, Gandhi's Truth, published in 1969, won a Pulitzer Prize. Erickson's theory has generated a moderately large body of research, much of it investigating the concepts of identity and uh, generativity. In this section of the chapter, the authors uh, focus on generativity and parenting and on generativity versus stagnation. Dan McAdams and colleagues have been major figures in research on generativity and have developed the Loyola Generativity Scale, or LGS, to measure it. Using the LGS, Bill Peterson uh, tested his prediction that parents with a high sense of generativity should produce well-adjusted offspring who were happier and more optimistic about the future. 
The results supported the idea that a sense of generativity is important to effective parenting. Children of highly generative parents had greater senses of confidence, freedom, and happiness, as well as a stronger future time orientation. Uh, these findings conform to Erickson's theory. Erickson generally considered generativity and stagnation to be opposite ends of the same continuum. But recently, researchers have begun to wonder if generativity and stagnation could be viewed as somewhat independent constructs. Van Heil and colleagues created a self-report measure, and the results of uh, this study supported the proposition that generativity and stagnation could be considered independently. The researchers found stagnation is related to problems in emotional regulation. They also found that some people are high on measures of both generativity and stagnation, and that this profile is associated with difficulty in regulating emotions and difficulties with intimacy. This research does not differ much from Erickson's model, but it does show that for practical research purposes and to understand adult personality more fully, generativity and stagnation sometimes operate separately. Although Erickson's work is a logical extension of Freud's psychoanalysis, it offers a new way of looking at human development. As a useful theory, it rates high on its ability to generate research and internal consistency, moderate on its ability to be falsified, to organize knowledge, and to guide the practitioner. And finally, it rates about average on parsimony. In his uh, concept of humanity, Erickson had a view of humanity which placed determinism over free will. Erickson saw humans as basically social animals who have limited free choice and who are motivated by past experiences, which may be either conscious or unconscious, so causality is rated higher than teleology. Unconscious and conscious is influenced by the stage, with unconscious dominating early life and conscious later stages. In addition, Erickson is rated high on both optimism and the uniqueness of individuals. He doesn't neglect the powerful influences of childhood experiences, but also emphasizes the continuous processes of personality development over the lifespan. While Freud focused on pathological outcomes, Erickson helped us to recognize the positive outcomes that can occur. Erickson's uh, life cycle or stages of development allows for second chances. In America, there has always been the idea of people being able to improve their situations by changing their social circumstances, such as getting a new job or moving. So Erickson was well received in the United States. One criticism of his work is that all of his subjects in psychobiographies and case studies were male. Later theorists have looked at the identity crises faced by girls and women.